Our final panel for the day is ready to commence. Our guests and our panelists and our moderator are on standby. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But before that, a um, reminder to um, give due accord to the COVID-19 protocols that we have instigated for this um, conference. And to remember to put on your masks properly, covering your nose and your mouth. Remember to use your hand sanitizers liberally. And remember that if you want to wash your hands, you can head out to the restroom out and to your left. If you have any medical emergencies, we have our clinic outside in the lobby available to attend to you. It has been a very, very enlightening day so far. And I'm looking forward to another enlightening discussion for this panel. Is everybody seated and settled? Our panel conversation is on using the guidelines for protecting schools and universities during armed conflict. During this panel, we will discuss data and perspectives from the Global Coalition, countries that have taken concrete steps to implement the guidelines, and the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Speaking on this panel will be Dr. Jerome Marston and Dr. Marika Solakis, senior researchers at the Global Coalition. Confirming that our panelists are set. Also on the panel is Mr. Anis Shushan, United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Mr. Charles Formillon, Charles Child Protection Advisor, United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in the Central African Republic. Ms. Tabitha Bonet, Senior Lawyer, Operational and International Humanitarian Law Team, Ministry of Defense Central Legal Services, United Kingdom. Ms. Beatrice Sierra, Technical Advisor, Humanitarian Action Office, Spanish Agency for International Development Corporation, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Spain. Moderating this panel will be Ambassador Frederique Viegas, the Permanent Representative of Argentina to the United Nations in Geneva. As before, I will act as a bit of a time um, warden and just pop in when it's five minutes to so that we can swing into the questions as well. But for now, Honorable Ambassador, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Arit Okpo and Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, representative of international organizations, representatives of civil society, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to be moderating today this panel on such an important topic, using the guidelines for protecting schools and universities during armed conflict is at the core of the Safe School Declaration. As you know, this declaration has been uh, fostered by Argentina, Norway, Spain, and Nigeria, and now we are very happy that we have over uh, 100, uh, actually 112 countries uh, supporting this important declaration. As you know, by endorsing this declaration, states commit to endorse and use the guidelines for protecting schools and universities from military use during armed conflict and bring them into domestic policy and operational frameworks as far as possible and appropriate. In this panel, uh, the Global Coalition will share data showing an overall reduction of military use in states that were early endorsers of the Safe Schools Declaration that we started in 2015. The UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations will discuss it, it ban on using school for military purposes and its impact in order to protect education and save lives. That's what we are here for. We will also explore how non-state armed groups can engage with the guidelines commitments to better protect education. First of all, we are going to hear some information on military use of schools and any reduction since the launch of the Safe Schools Declaration, as well as the impact of military use of schools on students and educators. So let me remind you how important this exercise is because we diplomats 
usually end up uh, in long negotiations adopting very important instruments. But one of the main uh, uh, main uh, uh, task is to fully follow up on the instruments we adopt to see if they are implemented or not. That is why this panel that I'm very honored to moderate is key on this this way of approaching the real implementation of declarations adopted. So without further ado, let me start with the first question for our two first panelists. And I thank you very much for this distinguished group of panelists I have as moderator, Dr. Jerome Marston and Dr. Marika Tsolakis, which it reads as follows. Uh, to what extent is military use of schools occurring globally and what has been the impact of this use on students and educators? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ambassador Villegas. Um, we're really honored to be here uh, with you and the rest of the panel today. And I think this is really a critical question to raise um, on this first day of the conference. Jerome and I are happy to share some of our coalition's latest research on this topic. Unfortunately, the military use of educational facilities continues to be a feature of armed conflicts around the world. And in fact, it affected over 20 countries in the last year alone. We actually saw that during the pandemic, the risk of this violation increased when both militaries and non-state armed groups took advantage of vacant schools uh, which further obstructed access to safe education globally. For example, in the last year and a half, our coalition identified over 450 reports of military use of schools and universities globally. This is a significant increase as compared to the same period in the prior two years. One of the contexts that really drove this increase was Myanmar, where over 40% of cases occurred there um, during this period. In Myanmar and elsewhere, both armed forces and non-state armed groups have used schools or universities for various military purposes. Sometimes fighters occupy schools and use them as bases or barracks. In other cases, schools are used as fighting positions, weapon storage, detention centers, or even for military training. Military use can last for a few hours, days, months, or even years in some cases. But regardless of the duration, when schools or universities are used, they become unsafe for learning and that restricts the fulfillment of the right to education. In the Central African Republic, for example, last year, the UN reported that 9,000 children were deprived of education due to just 13 cases of school occupation and attacks by armed groups. That's 9,000 children in just 13 schools. Imagine how many more thousands of children globally are missing out on an education because of military use. And equally troubling, imagine the thousands of children and young people who are forced to share their classrooms with soldiers occupying the building. Those kids face daily risks of crossfire, sexual violence, or even child recruitment. I'll let my colleague Jerome speak more on these impacts and also what can be done to end military use. Occupation of a school or university by armed forces or non-state armed groups can turn the educational facility into a military target, putting students and educators' lives in danger and exposing the facility to damage or destruction. Military use also puts students and educators at risk of sexual violence and places students at heightened risk of forced recruitment. For example, in Yemen from 2014 to mid 2020, Houthi forces systematically used schools to indoctrinate and recruit both male and female students. Armed forces and armed groups also damage schools and universities while using them. So even once the military force or armed group has vacated, the facilities often require repairs, which means further delays 
before classes can resume. But military use is not inevitable. The guidelines for protecting schools and universities from military use during armed conflict, a core component of the Safe Schools Declaration, were developed as a practical tool for governments, militaries, and non-state armed groups to use to restrict the military use of schools and universities. And there is some emerging evidence that the declaration and guidelines are working. Although the reported numbers of military use went up globally, as Marika just laid out, military use actually declined in roughly a dozen countries that endorsed the Safe Schools Declaration early. This reduction in military use was supported by new policies and military doctrines developed in line with the guidelines. So what does that look like by the numbers? The Global Coalition found that between 2015 and 2020, military use of schools and universities dropped from over 180 reported incidents to some 70. Among the 13 countries that experienced military use and signed the declaration in the first two years it was open for endorsement. For example, between 2015 and 2020, reported military use of schools declined by over 80% in both South Sudan and Afghanistan. GCP also observed declines in Central African Republic. Democratic Republic of Congo, and Somalia. As these figures and examples show, military use of schools and universities can be prevented. Thank you. We turn it back to you, Ambassador Villegas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, really a very important uh, uh, information that we have on the new laws and military policies created with the guidelines uh, by those governments that have earlier endorsed the creation support the reduction this is uh, a very uh, encouraging uh, data for further uh, adoptions of the declaration it is quite encouraging to hear the presentations on how the reported incidents have dropped. Um, now, let me turn, please, uh, to our next question for our third panelist, uh, Mr. Anis uh, Shushan, which uh, read as follows. The UN DPO has an explicit ban on using school schools for military purposes. How is this ban? being mainstream into operations, including trainings. Over to you, Fashim. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Excellencies, distinguished speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I would like to thank the government of Nigeria, as well as the governments of Argentina, Norway, and Spain, the African Union Commission, and the Global Coalition to Protect Education from attack uh, for convening this high-level event that I consider central to strengthen protect, uh, the protection of children and safeguarding their rights to education. This conference is an important example of an initiative jointly led by member states, UN agencies, and civil society organizations to progress the implementation of the Safe Schools Declaration and the guidelines. It also falls at a critical time when the ongoing COVID-19 crisis has arguably further exacerbated existing challenges to children, to children's safe access to education, specifically in countries affected by armed conflict. As we know, almost one in five children globally live in a conflict-affected country, with the dynamics of conflict severely and directly impacting on children's access to education. What is particularly concerning is the intensification of attacks on education. In 2020 alone, there were 535 verified attacks in schools, an increase of 17% compared to 2019. Therefore, protecting children affected by armed conflict is at the core of United Nations peace operations. 
This is underscored by 12 Security Council resolutions on, on child protection and children and uh, armed conflict adopted thus far, and specifically Resolution 2143, uh, 40, uh, which urges parties to armed conflict respect the civilian character of schools and to protect schools from attacks and use. In fact, protecting children in peacekeeping settings, including safeguarding their rights to education, is not the sole responsibility of our child protection teams. Since 1996, this mandate has been normatively and institutionally designed to be one of the uh, cuts um, that uh, across civilian and uniform components, sections, and mandates in our peacekeeping missions, and is therefore mainstreamed through uh, in relevant policy guidance and trainings. <clears throat> Most notably, the United Nations Infrastructure Battalion Manual uh, from 2012 and updated 2020 specifies that schools shall not be used by the military in their operations. This explicit ban on the use of schools for military purposes is further reflected in our joint DPO, DPPA, DOS 2017 child protection policy, which identifies the military use of schools as the key child protection concern and recognizes the adverse impact of the use of schools for military purposes, in particular, its effects on the safety of children and education personnel, the, the civilian nature of schools and the right to education. Both the Safe Schools Declaration and the guidelines are included in the policy as a reference under the international norms and standards on children's rights, stating in the strongest terms that United Nations Peace uh, Operations personnel shall at no time and for no amount of time use schools for military purposes in compliance with the prohibition included in the United Nations Infantry Battalion Manual. DPO has also developed uh, and regularly updated its specialized training materials for the UN military and police, which are aimed at building uniform personnel's child protection capacity uh, prior to their de uh, deployment to peacekeeping missions with a view to enabling them to effectively protect and promote child uh, children's rights in situations of armed conflict. Uh, each year since 2014, the DPO child protection team, in collaboration with the Swedish Armed Forces International Center, has been organizing a training course on this uh, on the UN specialized training materials for the uh, for the military on child protection. The establishment of a similar course for the UN police is currently in progress. These efforts was notably yielded to direct positive results in the field. These include the development of standard operating procedures to guide effective advocacy and dialogue with non-state armed groups with the aim to protect and prevent attacks on schools in the Democratic Republic of the Congo support to national coordination mechanisms and relevant child protection actors to ensure the safe reopening of schools in Mali and the issuance of a directive prohibiting parties to the conflict from using a school or university in the Central African Republic. My colleague Charles from the United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in the Central African Republic will elaborate on the latter example. I believe that initiatives like this conference will not only foster collaboration in advance to, uh, protecting, uh, to the protection of education in our conflict, but further encourage progress by states in endorsing and implementing the declaration. We stand ready to expand our co collaboration with all stakeholders to ensure that schools are protected from attacks and uh, use that children um, uh, affected by armed conflict can access education safely. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anis. And indeed, the role of the Department of uh, Peacekeeping Operations is at the core of the implementation of the guidelines. And this is very important because the peacekeeping is always the first that we look to set an example of how things should be carried out in the field. So it's very important for the for the promotion and, and dissemination of this declaration that the Department of Peacekeeping Operation is having at the core of its action, uh, uh, the, the declaration and the guidelines, because as you know, the peacekeeping uh, forces are integrated by several forces of different countries. And at the same time, you have a very important regional centers for training in all, all parts of the world. So we are incorporating the curricula of armed forces from all over the world, literally, 
that participate in peacekeeping this new uh, step in mankind to protect schools from armed conflict. So thank you very much for, for your work and, and your interesting uh, response to the question. Now, uh, let me please introduce our next question for our fourth panelist, Mr. Charles uh, Fomunyam, and the question is as follows. Uh, Charles, in 2015, MINUSCA issued a directive prohibiting parties to the conflict from using a school or university. How did this directive uh, came about and what impact has it had on protecting education? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, and I want to say good afternoon to everybody and now a special thank you to the organizers of the forum, particularly for the invitation so that we share our experience out here in the Central African Republic. Uh, as you know, Minister was set up in 2014, September 2014. But at the outbreak of the conflict in the Central African Republic, the African Union did send troops to try to protect civilians, see what can be done on the ground. Unfortunately, when these troops got to the ground, uh, many of them occupied schools as their bases and particularly at the invitation of authorities. So when the minister was set up, these troops had to be re rehatted into the United Nations. Uh, being child protection advisor in the mission, uh, I had observed the occupation of schools by these troops and I'd been trying to train them, but there was no direct collaboration with African Union and the United Nations. So when they were rehatted, we, we, we did training, we trained uh, those troops. And we thought uh, to make sure it is cemented that no school should be occupied by United Nations troops, we came up with this directive, which prohibited the use of schools and universities by the United Nations troops. It wasn't for parties to the country, it was for the United Nations troops. Um, what, 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 what really brought this again was the fact that if United Nations troops are occupying schools, then the United Nations will have no authority to ask armed groups not to occupy or attack schools. Because as you would know, child protection within minister and within the United Nations has as a role to implement United Nations Security Council resolutions on children and armed conflict. My colleague Anisio said there are 12 of them. And, and the ambassador just said equally, uh, this instruments, resolutions can be signed, but if they are not implemented on the ground, it will never be effective. So we wanted to make sure that armed groups leave schools they were occupying. And to do that, we have to show the examples. And that's how we came with this, with this, uh, with this directive. What has been the impact? The impact has been since the, the issuance of that directive, no minister troop, police or military has occupied any school within within the country. And in the implementation of the resolution, the force has gone further to use it as an advocacy tool with the, to engage with the, with, with the armed groups. Each time they tell the armed groups, you don't have to occupy schools. And to the extent that they have said no checkpoint of an armed group or any military should be set up within 500 meters of a school because it, it disrupts the, the functioning of the, of the school. In one case in 2000 and school, an armed group hesitated and Minister threatened to use force to ensure the school was vacated. And finally, the armed group vacated, vacated the, the school. And of course, as my colleague also said, the directive, one of the impacts is that it is used to be as the best practice in all peace operations. to ensure that peacekeeping forces do not, do not, of course, occupy school. I would go further to, to, to talk a bit about the prevailing situation in the Central African Republic. A peace agreement was signed in 2015, and in that peace agreement, it is prohibited to attack or use school. And mechanisms on the ground which are used by MINISCA and all the other persons to monitor the violations against this peace accord, and one of them, of course, are schools occupied. That's very important. And 
In 2020, the government enacted the Child Protection Code, which of course prohibits also attacks and occupation of, of, of schools. We are ensuring, following up, to ensure the implementation of, implementation of those. Of those. And uh, one of the things we have on the ground now is a new trend because we have new allies, new parties to the conflict of Ghana, and so it's a bit challenging for us because they started occupying schools. Armed groups, somebody said that school, the occupation of schools, had, use of schools had really reduced because we had engaged armed groups so much so that they understood they couldn't. But now with the new allies who have come in, with the violence during the elections, many schools have been attacked, many schools have been, have been occupied. We are still trying to see how we can engage this, these new allies. Unfortunately, they are being a bit reticent, but we are working to see how we can do that. What are the perspectives? The perspective for us is, as, long, as far as that directive is concerned, to ensure that it includes civilians, because we did it only for the military and the police. But we did notice that when ongoing work is we have an ongoing work, the civilian component can go and set up a structure near a school. If they do, military will be forced to, 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 to go and protect it. Protecting it means they can be attacked. They, if they are attacked, they will attack schools. So we want to take it directly to include civilians. Nothing concerning the United Nations should be installed near a school site. And secondly, we are trying to strengthen coordination with other child protection partners to make sure that once schools are vacated, everything should be done so that those schools can become functioning. Because one of the problems is most of these schools are not functional. Once they are not functional, the military gets into the village, they, that's why they settle. I think this is, this is where we are now, and we will continue to work with the government to ensure the child protection policy. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Charles, and to listen to your experience in the ground in applying the, the guidelines. It's very important. It is always encouraging to hear about the work in MINUSCA uh, and the positive impact on the ground, uh, mainly taking into account these uh, directives and replicating the text uh, on the SS guidelines. Uh, now I would like to turn to our next panelist. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Ms. Tabita Moni, a senior lawyer, operational and international humanitarian law team in the Ministry of Defense of the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, for Tabitha, I would like to pose this question to listen to her view. Um, the UK explicitly protects educational institutions in its manual of armed forces law. How is this implemented? And thus, the UK implements the guidelines in its military training with partners globally. Tabitha, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Viegas, and thank you to the Global Coalition for organizing this conference and for inviting the UK to, to share our experience and approach to this important issue. The UK has long recognized the status of schools as typical or even exemplary civilian objects, both in its manual on the law of armed conflict and in its procedures on the approach to armed conflict. The basic legal position is set out in Article 53.3 of Additional Protocol 1 and reflected in the UK's manual. It states that objects that are normally used for civilian purposes are to be presumed not to be being used for not to be used for military purposes. Such objects include churches, dwelling houses, residential flats, commercial offices, factories, shopping precincts and, precincts, and importantly, schools and libraries. Our manual goes on to say that, for example, it, if it is suspected that a schoolhouse is situated in a commanding tactical position and being used by an adversary, as an observation post or a gun placement. This suspicion, if it's unsupported by evidence, is not enough to justify an attack on the schoolhouse. There is, uh, where there is doubt as to the status of the target, uh, a pilot, for example, may not be able to resolve that doubt even by visual observation in order to justify an attack. It is important to rely on intelligence relayed to the, him if there are doubts about uh, reliability. 
The UK's manual was published in 2004 and actually preceded the Safe Schools Declaration and the UK's uh, uh, endorsement of it. As this document continues to be reviewed and updated, I would expect it to become even more specific in its reference to the guidelines themselves. The cautious approach that is identified in the manual is one that is a direct reflection of the UK's legal responsibilities. It is not the end of the story. Each theatre of operation has specific a specific authorities framework, including rules of engagement, which take account of the expected conditions. In urban environments or areas where we would expect to see civilian infrastructure, this will include specific instructions in relation to that infrastructure, balancing the achievement of a military objective with our overall objective of establishing peace and security in the area. The recognition of schools is key to that obje overall objective. Our uh, manual on the uh, law of armed conflict does engage with cultural property and the likelihood that cultural property will include institutions dedicated to education. And uh, the manual on the law of armed conflict will, says that the law prohibits the use of such property, which is likely to expose that, that property to destruction or damage in armed conflict, unless there is no feasible alternative. In terms of overall objective, it is important to highlight the UK's wider approach to safe schools and how we build in this to our holistic approach to protecting civilians and uh, engaging with human security. Within our institutional human security strategy, the UK recognises the dire impact of the conflict on children and youth and the fact that this impact, including disruption to education and um, likelihood that when education is disrupted due to armed conflict, that there is a low likelihood that children, particularly girls, will return. This problem becomes a wide and persistent driver of instability. As Kofi Annan stated, education is, quite simply, peace building by another name. It is the most effective form of defence there is. The UK considers international humanitarian law as a principle-based legal framework to be designed specifically to, for, uh, for conflict, to be central to the regulation of armed conflict. It is therefore necessary to recognise the importance of the centrality of international humanitarian law and the protections that it affords children and vulnerable groups. Nevertheless, the impact on com conflict reaches beyond the conduct of hostilities. In recent armed conflicts, non-combatants have been the main victims, and this has major consequences for children. These can be immediate physical consequences, but also long-term, lifelong consequences, resulting, for example, from displacement or the loss of access to education or healthcare. Armed actors can be perpetrators of violence against children, but they can also play an important role and have responsibility in protecting them. The UK recognises that protecting children from the effects of armed conflict is both a moral, legal and strategic imperative and an essential element to break the cycle of violence. The UK Ministry of Defence's uh, strategy on human security specifically addresses protection for children and youth. The UK will incorporate the understandings of elements that affect children and youth, in particular the six grave violations, in planning at, at, at all levels of implementation of military operations. The UK takes action to prevent and respond to, to issues involving children and armed conflict and proactively prevent incidences. Uh, it looks to deter perpetrators, protect respond and report any violations uh, to the protected status of children in armed conflict, as well as the wider impact on operations of children and refer victims. The UK works towards ensuring that we do not undertake partnership or training with units which employ children or those that detain children solely for membership, perceived or actual use in armed groups. We monitor the conduct of partner forces to ensure compliance with IHL, 
and international human rights law to assess risks to children and to respond to any reports of grave violations. And then very specifically for today's purposes, the UK will not use schools, universities or places of learning for any purpose or to carry out any security task in clo close proximity to such buildings in line with the Safe Schools Declaration and Guidelines. Um, in, also, in we would ensure that all operations and options have been explored when a school is being used by an adversary in a way that makes it a military objective. Um, and where practical, we will uh, liaise with national and intergovernmental organisations uh, who are involved in the protection of children and schools during and after military operations. Safe schools implementation across defence it is a matter for implementation across defence. The military and their legal advisers must fully understand their obligations under the law. Rules of engagement and authorities take full account of civilian objects, in particular schools, and ensure that there are suitable protections for such infrastructure. We place human security advisers at the centre of our deployments. The UK Ministry of Defence is currently updating the human security guidelines with a view to gaining a heightened understanding of the human environment and conflict drivers to entrench human security in the way defence operates. This enables the UK armed forces to act as a force for good, minimising harm to civilians and maintaining moral legitimacy. The Safe Schools Declaration is an important measure. We have adopted a holistic approach to human security, considering both the uh, particular and cumulative impact of the Declaration and guidelines alongside other measures such as women, peace and security, prevention of sexual exploitation, human trafficking and the protection of cultural property. Thank you. Thank you very much and very interesting the legal approach in the UK towards these uh, issues and also the interlinkage with international human rights law uh, because we have to, to remember that the right to education is a human right, especially for children. Uh, therefore, uh, there is a very, uh, very important linkage with international humanitarian law in this case. So, thank you very much. Um, now, let me please introduce our last question for our next panelist, Ms. Beatriz Sierra Santos from the AECID. And the question for you, Ms. Sierra Santos, is as follows. How is Spain supporting implementation of the SSD and the guidelines specifically? Thank you. Over to you. Muchas gracias. Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, quisiera comenzar agradeciendo al gobierno de Nigeria y la coalición su gran trabajo por hacer posible que nos reunamos estos días desde Abuya y desde tantos lugares del mundo. Intentaré explicarles en pocos minutos cómo está apoyando la cooperación española la implementación. How this is happening? Um, the guidelines. The commitment we have in, in, in this is this about in the framework of the humanitarian work is about exterior. Our country, the protection of civilians, the promotion of our international, as supposed the application of our commitments, the situation of children in schools in, in conflict, armed, armed conflicts and a budget declaration of our adoptees as the framework of action in May 2015. We also started, we had it clear that it was this symbolic a political compromise and we made effort. It was the next objective that is why I made advance in this. Beyond that, what we did was to work to incorporate our compromise, the importance of our work, the incidences of all the for international for in the instrument for for that after the conference we had in Buenos Aires, Spain. Spain organized some conference in La Palma in 2000. 
We had a performance that our, our travaku was, our work was not finished after that. Our work in Parma was pra practical conclusions and other objectives. Yeah. Then we had the necessity to uh, expand what we had done. We, 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 we wanted to do oper operating manuals, which we presented. It was like this. We created a, a program, a cooperation program in, in organizing places. The coalition and I uh, think international program of technical and the material. During four weeks in fe fe February, virtual, more than 80 representatives of Ministry of Education, ex Ministry of External Affairs, representatives of uh, other organizations in Norway and our uh, own civil societies, specialized agencies, did a lot of virtual work. We worked together of uh, practical experiences. The training was in, in this one attacks against the schools and using schools for military purposes in the, in the, in the French the impact for, for girl, child and women. The second was the declaration of the, of the guidelines. The third one was the monitoring of the attacks and a focus on an interactive methodology of ex brief exposition practicals. All this combined in, in, the, in the training platform, permanent training platform with an online connection done weekly. In, in the plenary session, we had work linguistic work. We also participated in these groups to make sure that of how these guidelines will lead to the implementation of this before and after the an action, a military action to avoid attacks on installations and military places. Equally based on the collection of analysis of act action of, uh, of the coalition, we worked on how to prevent an attack using the, the formula we created in, in the various practices of, of these guidelines in, in Burkina Faso, in Norway, especially the experience the working group had in Nigeria close to the declaration of, of that country. We also had the luck of having the work of professionals in this in the sectors of many of them had this conference concretely in this panel organizations important organizations like we see save the children participated in in, in these things and made the presented papers that helped a lot in these uh, decisions making it possible to reach the goals of this training, also training of, of these guidelines. As you can see, all this we are thought as a methodology to strengthen the training, the reflections, the debates in these four weeks have been a, 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 good, a good learning conclusions of this seminar consisting in the great challenges that we need as a, a secure education. On, on the one part, all these levels, effective implementation of these guidelines is fundamental to continue in this act in a, in a higher level in order to make sure that declaration is make sure that all countries in exception implement this declaration it's also it's also 
integrating guidelines and peculiarities of different countries. For also, it is the role of, of, of each country will play is crucial. The efforts and all, on other, other levels. In second place, it identify the form in which is impressive. State actors like militaries, armed groups, and religious uh, bodies, all of them have to work together to make sure that education is guaranteed. All these trained very well in in precaution be prevention of schools and children can be maintained maintain a dialogue that will help in the implementation of these things the education community also should help should know the efforts that's being done towards this to this end in case an attack comes should and in third place we need a fundamental, a multi-temporal uh, work for God with information, uh, sorry, sorry, the information, mitigation, and return of God. And accountability and gender-based efforts. Fourth. We have to strengthen the, mechanism, the accountability mechanisms should be reinforced. This course helped us to see the basis of in which Spain should maintain its leadership. It's very important that this training organized made possible. We continue the programming and 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 and. and, and with this coalition, we are organizing exactly the, the same format in this, in this scenery, specifically. For example, we have been thinking of the possibility of present training during the cooperation of Spain, uh, adequate uh, physical training creating courses and trainings in some in, in the guidelines our work now with the help of the coalition is on behalf give training courses adequate training courses when necessary we also thought of the declaration of for our own through our own personal our own civil servants are also trained in these things and of course trained people who should know be in civil societies to be able also to help in the implementation of this declaration it looks fundamental to us that we people who work in in the in, in the in the ambit of education for all over the world Incidentia for all this compromise. This uh, uh, agenda of uh, secure schools. Beyond the technical cooperation, I'll sh briefly say how we have strengthened the education sector in Spain. Especialmente uh, education during conflicts. Through resources, economic resources. Our principal uh, partners. A través a meeting humanitarian. For example, in Nigeria and, and in Borno and Adamawa, we, we have held 17 different uh, groups who help boys and girls during conflicts. We also have gender based components. NGOs también working there. We have uh, helped them access to quality education and security for children in the Northeast. In Mali, we have also helped in uh, helping in a project in that area, helping 
young girls helping displaced persons also in the Rohingya people in Myanmar we have also worked there and I helped them supported them through fundamentally in the Syrian crisis we have also helped in the question of emergency in education we have helped against hunger in Syria too to make sure of a uh, sure education and the creation of a uh, favorable environment for education we have submit we have supported the uh, annual intervention through the uh, education through the, the Syrian population we have also worked in in education in the Congo in, and in Burundi in this context through the NGOs we also supported UNICEF in the cooperation Spanish cooperation also attention profession for education in, in humanitarian these are just some of the examples that Spain have uh, worked on all the compromises of all the states that of all the states have made are also me concrete measures bearing in mind that the children must be protected and helped to get quality education fundamentally we share experiences and practices based on this we also in this practice the declar declaration and guidelines are not are not infallible one has to work on them and see how we can also achieve the objective of uh, of secure education thank you very much Muchas gracias, solo para saber. A ver si tenemos un, unas preguntas. Thank you. Honorable Ambassador, I'd like to crave your indulgence to open the floor for a few questions. May I go ahead? Go ahead. I think, I think we can, can take, take one you. question from the room. We have just... Um, about four minutes to go. Do we have any questions from the room? We have one microphone over there. While we are waiting for that, I would like to ask one question that we have from our virtual audience, and this is for the Global Coalition. Um, the Global Coalition mentioned that rates of military use went up in the last two years. Has COVID-19 impacted the rates of military use around the world? And if yes, how? Um, because we have such limited time, I'd like to ask that you keep your answers to about two minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent question. Um, I think that we are still in the process of really understanding the extent to which military use has impacted, or the, the rate, the extent to which COVID-19 has impacted military use globally. We do know that attacks on education and military use increased by a third between 2019 and 2020. And we have, uh, you know, emerging evidence that in certain countries, armed forces and armed groups um, certainly took advantage of vacant schools during the pandemic. Um, we know, for example, in Sudan, that um, Sudan's rapid support forces occupied a girls' school that was closed during the pandemic um, and used it as a training base. And that school couldn't reopen after um, COVID-19 measures were lifted because the military was still there. Um, we also know that there was a school in Afghanistan, for example, where the Taliban um, established a position inside of the school in Takar province. And that school served um, over a thousand students. Uh, though it was closed during COVID-19, uh, the armed groups set fire to the building. They destroyed education materials and equipment, um, which means that when schools were open, it was much more, you know, it was very challenging for that school to, to reopen in, in, in full capacity. And then um, 
as we'd also mentioned before, we know that in Myanmar, you know, close to 200 schools have been used for military purposes just since the beginning of the year alone. And many of those schools, um, there that use began during um, school closures due to COVID-19. Um, and that could, I think that um, definitely contributed to the staggering number of, of schools that were, were used during that period. Um, so these are some of the emerging evidence that we have, um, that we've collected at the coalition. All right, sir, can I ask that you keep your question brief? so that we can also get it answered before we have to round up. Thank you. I don't hear you just no. yet. Let's see. And please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mikhail Ibrahim. Um, I'm an education advisor with Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. Um, just reflecting on um, my experience in the field, of course, nobody opt for conflict. It is a circumstantial thing. Um, in Zamfara, for example, one of my most horrible experiences was seeing bandits in schools. And if I look at uh, the structure of communities, and see the kind of facilities that are in schools, they make them the most attractive places for occupation. Now, from the experiences of various presenters, um, one thing about life is that if there is no option or you're not thinking about options, you are likely to use other things that exist. So the question is, from experience, what other structures within communities that we see um, state and non-state actors use in situations of uh, conflict. Do they provide them themselves or they go into other civilian spaces like markets, like religious spaces and, and others? So it's good to reflect on, on this while we are trying to protect schools because thinking about those alternatives is as good as protecting schools. So I want to hear about those experiences. Thank you. Let me clarify that your question is saying that what are the alternatives? So basically, there are other spaces, markets and so on. Yes. And if schools are not used, then there is a chance that it makes these other spaces targets. And I want it from the viewpoint of experiences. Okay. I'm not suggesting because I know that it's not as good to occupy other civilian uh, places. But you're As asking it's not good to occupy uh, that schools. This is a complicated situation. That is, is it. Is your question addressed to someone specific? Well, we are talking about guidelines, mm -hmm. um, using the guidelines. Um, Who would you like to address well, your question to? Well, I, I listened to uh, Thebitha from the UK, MOD, okay. and which has um, uh, a, a sort of guideline document, a manual that predates uh, this. Um, perhaps I think um, she that might be best to suited her. to answer. Yes. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, sir. Um, can I have Ms. Boni? Do you have perspectives on that question? So he's talking about the complicatedness of it. If schools are not used, then that might make it um, make other options more attractive. And he's saying, you know, how do we resolve this situation, or how, well, do, how we do we engage, engage with? You're muted. You're, you're muted, I think. Thank you. Yeah. My apology. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to agree that this is a very complicated situation. And what we have to remember is that it, schools are protected as civili civilian objects, but then so are uh, markets and... and um, uh, civil infrastructure like buildings, so other sorts of facilities that might have similar characteristics to schools that might attract um, armed groups. So I don't, I don't think that there is, there is an easy answer as to how you balance all of these considerations. So I think that what we really need to do is engage with, um, uh, engage with 
armed groups recognize that that there is something of a differential between what states might do when they are parties to armed conflict because they have resources they they don't necessarily have to to rely on the local infrastructure in order to con uh, to conduct their their armed conflict uh, so the the difference in behavior that you might see from from organized militaries and then from the sorts of non-state armed groups that that might actually be seeking to use uh, built-up areas with all of that civilian infrastructure. Uh, so it's important to recognize that is a problem and then use the, the various mechanisms that we are using in order to engage with that. And so in some cases that is about compliance. And so there is some very important work that, that, uh, that the ICRC and Geneva call are, are doing in terms of in, improving compliance with both the law and with practice on the part of armed groups in order to, as a generality, protect uh, protect civilians. So I think that really that that is the the the, the main thrust of of the answer to this question because uh, any conflict within uh, within uh, urban environments or where there's lots of civilian uh, infrastructure is incredibly complicated. I think that you gave a very very. Um the best answer possible in these circumstances, because it is a complicated question and there are no easy answers, but it is helpful to remember that all of these spaces should be protected and one is not a more attractive option than the other. I don't believe that that's how it works. Thank you, Thank you so, so much to our panel for another really engaging conversation. A special thanks to Ms. Beatrice Sierra, Ms. Tabitha Bonney, Mr. Charles Fomuyan, Mr. Anis Shushan, Dr. Jerome Marston, and Dr. Marika Solakis. Our profound appreciations also to our moderator for this panel, Ambassador Frederike Viegas. Thank you for a great conversation, and we enjoyed listening to you very much. It has been, can we give them a round of applause? Yes, please. I think that we can all agree that today has given us much to reflect on and much to think about. At the beginning of this, um, today's activities, we talked about the fact that our aim here is to move the conversation from endorsement to implementation. And we've had a talk about the challenges, we've had a talk about the different, using the guidelines in areas of armed conflict, and I think we have a lot to reflect on. Distinguished guests, it has been a pleasure to moderate today's activities with you. You have been a wonderful audience. I am hoping that more of you will ask questions tomorrow. Should we try for that? Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for your time. And we will see you tomorrow morning by 9.30 a.m. for another one more day of great conversations, great panels, and the discussion of a way forward. Have a wonderful evening. And today's sessions are closed. <laughs>